You know, I don't know how it's possible, but Shelly just keeps getting more and more beautiful. I can't wait till tomorrow. That's my wife, in case you're just tuning in. <laughs> Speaking of love, the Bible says God is love. It's a very simple verse, just three words, but it means so much. Yeah. Is it really that simple? When we say God is love, what do we mean? I mean, we say, I love pizza. Is that the same? I love my wife. I love spring break. I love ice cream. So many things we say we love. So where do you get your definition of God's love? Where do you get it? Where, like, I'm sure you have something in mind of whether God is loving or not or what his love is like. Where, where, do, you, where do you get your definition? Since love is one of those things that we have love, and God has love, so we share that characteristic with him. There are many characteristics we don't share with God, but we do share love. We love, he loves. And so it's tempting to say, well, God's love must look like my love, or it must look like human love. So when you think about God's love, you probably think about all the nice things that God does for you. He does many loving, nice things for you. He's, he has your back. He heals you. He answers prayers. He guides you. He takes care of you. He brings you happiness and fulfillment. He gives you things. So many nice things that God does, but is that the extent of God's love? Can you sum up all of God's love by just saying he does nice things for me? Or is there more? I believe there's more. That verse, God is love. Well, the best way to find, to really understand any verse in the Bible is to compare that verse with the rest of the Bible. That is the number one way to understand the Bible. Whenever you look at one little part, you need to look at it through the, whole, through the lens of the whole Bible. What does the whole Bible say about that? So we're going to look at, uh, over these next several weeks as we're starting a new series, No Greater Love, we're going to look at God's love, and we're going to look at the Bible. What does the Bible say about God's love? So we need to use that for some context. Along with that, I've been reading this book called His Love Endures Forever by Gary J. Williams. And I'm kind of using that as the springboard uh, for this message series. And he got me thinking that Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 in the Bible that husbands are to love your wives like Jesus loves the church. So we listen, to, we hear that verse, and it's very, it's very inspiring. It's, it's also sort of intimidating. Wow, you know, for husbands. But then it makes me ask the question, does, is God's love husbandly? Does God love like an earthly husband does? Well, on some level, yes, he does. I mean, that's why, that's, that illustration is in the Bible for a reason. But... Going the other way, we cannot define God's love by husbandly love. We define husbandly love by God's love. It's, that's, the, that's the correct direction that, that that goes. Because when you think about it, husbands are kind of fickle when it comes to love. Wives are kind of fickle when it comes to love. I was thinking about uh, a person that is uh, super famous, J-Lo. Jennifer Lopez. So 20 years ago, she said she was madly in love with Mr. Affleck. <laughs> and she and Ben were engaged. They were going to get married. Everything seemed to be going well, according to the media. And then, just a couple days before the wedding, she broke it off. And I'm sure she had what she thought were good reasons. In the next 20 years, they both had many relationships and now, recently, they got married. J-Lo got married to Ben Affleck. And it just made me think about just, just that sort of a celebrated, you know, their celebrities kind of um, a marriage and relationship. But it just made me think about how fickle we are and how fickle husbands and wives are. So we cannot define God's love by our love. 
we need to try to have God be the standard for our love. We need to, we need to chase after him. But we, when you picture God's love for you, you can't picture it in terms of husbandly love that you know on earth because we fall short and God doesn't fall short. Even in the best marriage, feelings go up and down. Sometimes everyone feels all excited and happy and sometimes you just feel low. The, the, the relationships ebb and flow. And so that makes me wonder, could Jesus ever fall out of love with the church? Because Paul said, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Well, husbands say they fall out of love sometimes. Could Jesus fall out of love with the church? Does God love you more or less on certain days? Like, does some days God really feels like he loves you, and some days God, eh, he's not so sure. He's, eh, the toy cost. Like, is that how God is? We need to find out how God is from his word, the Bible. And that's why we're going to take several weeks and just dig in to what does God's word say about God's love for you. And you're going to find out God's love surpasses any human love. It is way more amazing, way more wonderful than any other kind of love. Is God's love just like an arranged marriage? where it's just sort of, he made a decision, I love you, but he doesn't feel anything for you. Is that how God is? No. Well, we're going to look in God's word, and you're going to find out God loves you so much in every way, decision way, commitment way, feelings way, passion way. God loves you, and he is love. That's why I started by saying today, God is love. So he does not um, does not give up on you. He, he stays constant. God loves you. And that is good news. God loves you more than any husband, more than any parent, more than any pet owner. God loves you. And when he says he loves you, he proves it. So when we try to think of what God's love is like, when we try to understand God's love, we, we run into obstacles because we, we are so tied to what we see around us and even what we see in ourselves. So why is it so hard to define and understand God's love? Well, first of all, God is vast and we are small. God is massive. He's vast. And we are finite and small. I love what it says in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 40 and a few select verses from that passage, Isaiah 40. And the, 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 the prophet is just trying to describe God for us. He says, no, for God, all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. So for us, all the nations of the world, that is so vast and so, so much bigger than us. But for God, it's like a little drop of water. All the nations of the world for God are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. That's how massive God is and how vast he is. God himself in the same chapter, verse 25, says, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One? And then Isaiah goes on to say, Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? Who did create them? God. So God created all this vast universe, and God's creation is mind-bogglingly, bogglingly, I don't even know how to say that, massive. Not even positive it's a word, but I do love it. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. Like I just, I cannot even comprehend. In my mind, a hundred galaxies would be a lot. Billions? I don't even get it. In our own galaxy, the Milky Way, I am told there are between 200 to 400 billion stars, suns, 200, 200 billion to 400 billion stars like our sun. And think of it, God made that. He's bigger than that. I, I just can't even get there in my mind how vast, how awesome, how great 
God is. He is immeasurable. And it's not because we don't have a tape measure long enough to measure God. It's because he is even outside of measurement. He is beyond that. Even time does not confine our God. He is outside of time. He is beyond it. He is so vast. He's infinite. And God is spirit. You know, we are, are, are we're finite. We have a body. God is spirit, and his word says that he fills everything. He is everywhere. But yet, if you clap your hands right now in the room, you're not squishing God. He's everywhere. He's here. But you can't squish him when you clap your hands. He is spirit. We're bodies. We, we know everything by our bodies, by our senses, by, by thinking about it, by observing, by our eyes, by our ears, by our noses. But God is beyond that. He is knowable, and yet he's beyond knowing. He's infinite. Like we would just barely scratch the surface every time we think we get to know God a little bit better. So how could we ever understand his love from a God who is so vast. Our problem is we are limited by our size. Another reason it's hard for us to even get a complete revelation of God's love is that when God was revealing, we were rebelling. When God was revealing himself, we were rebelling. We go all the way back to the beginning. When, uh, when God placed Adam and Eve, the first people on this earth, in the garden, God generally revealed his, his, himself. We call it general revelation, where, where if you just look around, you can see the handprints of God. When Adam and Eve looked at each other, they were made in the image of God. And so when they looked at each other, they saw a little bit of, God's, of God in his creation. They saw his handiwork. When they looked around at the planet, at the garden, at the beauty all around them, they could see God generally revealing himself through that. In the Bible, in Psalm 19, it says that the heavens proclaim the glory of God. So everywhere you look in God's creation, he is revealing himself. That, we call that general revelation. But Adam and Eve still needed specific revelation. So God used his words, and he talked to them, and he gave them mission. He gave them purpose. He, he gave them an invitation to be with him, to participate with him, him in his work. He also set some boundaries. And he said, I've made all this beautiful creation for you to enjoy, but I want you to keep away from this one tree in the garden, the tree of the, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. And God used his words to say, don't go and eat that. Don't touch that tree. Don't eat that fruit. That was specific revelation. So everywhere you look, you can see a hint of God. But then God also spoke to us. and spoke to us as people. But then they disobeyed the one rule. Don't touch that tree. They went and they ate that fruit. And so now uh, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden where they had walked with God in the cool of the day. And so we as a people lost our easy access to God's special revelation that day. Our problem is we are limited by our sin. Oh, if only there was some way for God to become smaller and our sin to be dealt with so that we could know God. If only there was a way. Jesus. God made a way for us to be able to have access to him again. God became small. He was born as a baby in that little town of Bethlehem so long ago. He took on flesh and bones. He lived among us. John, in the Bible, in John chapter 1, he says, he lived among us and we beheld his glory. We touched him. We touched God because Jesus is God with flesh and bones on. He is God the Son. He is God. So God became small. That took care of our first problem. And then the second thing, God paid for our sin. And when, he, when Jesus took our sins in his body on the cross, this is what, what happened. In John 15, Jesus said, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
There's no greater love. And that's where we got the name of this series from Jesus' words. There's no greater love. If you want to know God's love, even though he is so vast, his love is beyond understanding, we still get a glimpse of God's love in Jesus, in what Jesus did for us. He showed us, he showed you and me, the greatest love by laying down his life for us. Like a husband, Jesus loves us with passion, commitment, and strength. And he proved that on the cross. But he did not stay dead. Somebody say amen. He did not stay dead. And that's what we celebrated last week on Easter. Jesus rose from the dead. And now we have access to to God directly again. Even though Jesus walked up for a while among us, he said, if I go away, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. God in spirit is here and with us and in us if you've invited him into your life. In the book of Hebrews in the Bible, chapter 10, it says that by his death, Jesus opened a new and living way into God's presence. Jesus offers us eternal life and access to him. Now, we do have special revelation, just like God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden, talking with them. We can talk to Jesus. We can hear from God. God can speak to you, and we have direct access to God. Jesus dealt with all of our problems in getting to know God. Praise the Lord. But Paul prayed, one of the early church leaders, Paul prayed that you and, I, uh, you and I would understand the massive, beyond understanding love of God. And this is going to become our key verse for this series of messages. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. I love these two verses. It's so powerful. Paul writes to us, And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should understand, how wide? Someone say, how wide? How, wide. how long? Someone say that. How, long. how, high. how high? And how deep? How deep. May, may all God's people understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience, someone say experience, experience. not just study, but experience the love of Christ though it is too great to, full, to understand fully. So Paul says, I pray that you would understand the love of God. And then in the next sentence he says, but it's too great to understand fully. But we just got to start chipping away at it and know from God's word and from his, how he's demonstrated that he loves us. What will happen then? Then you will be made complete. Someone say complete. I want to be complete. With all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Wow! That's our task over these next few weeks, to understand God's love for you and for me and for the world, even though it's beyond understanding. We're going to work at it and understanding and experiencing the love of God. I love that he says, I pray that you may have the power to understand. We know that the power of God comes through this, through his Holy Spirit. So there is something there that we actually need God's Holy Spirit to even begin to understand the love of God for us. It takes his Spirit's power. How wide is God's love? Well, I'll tell you this. It's wide enough to embrace every nation on earth. Even the nations and cultures that are at war with each other, God's love is wide enough to embrace them. That's how wide it is. God's love is wide enough to embrace all the poor of the world, to embrace all the most wealthy of the world, and to embrace everyone in between. That's how wide God's love is. I can't even begin to understand that. I can barely love fully the persons that are just right in front of me on any given day. And God's love is wide enough to love everybody. How long is God's love? Well, it's long enough to last forever. Good news is, even though we may be fickle, God is not. He is love, and his love just goes on and on and on forever. That's how long it is. It never gives up. Never loses faith. 
is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance, it says in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13. You see how we're getting a little bit of context for when it says God is love? The context is God's word. Is, God's word. What else does God's word say about his love? Well, uh, Paul said, I, I, I pray you be understand, able to understand how high is God's love. It's high enough to lift us to heaven. It's high enough to reach to the highest place on earth to kings and queens and presidents. It's, it's that high. God's love is high enough to get there. But also, how deep is the love of God? Well, it's deep enough to reach to the lowest valley. It's deep enough to reach to the person who feels like they are at rock bottom in their life. And that may be you today. God's love is deep enough to reach you, whether you're high and exalted or low and beaten down. God's love is deep enough to reach you. And there, there's a song that's on the, on the radio a lot right now, if you listen to Christian radio, called Greater Still by Brandon Lake. I encourage you, listen to that song. If you just need to be encouraged a little bit about God's love, and he, he uses that little phrase from our key verse, how wide, how long, how high, how deep. He uses that. Uh, and it's just, just very encouraging. I just, that's just for free. I just throw, you, throw it out there. So the essence of the Christian life is to experience and personally know God's grace and love in Jesus. That's, that's what it's about. That is, that is what, we're, that's what we're here for. That's what we've been invited to, to know, to understand, to experience the love of God in Christ. And when, when Jesus comes into your life and his love, you're made complete. You're filled with the life and power of God. His life and power are yours because of God's love. That's what it says in Ephesians 3. Sometimes we look at God's word and we say, hmm, I don't know if that's true because my experience is not matching up to that. Here's the deal. God's word is true. We got to match our experience to him. And we got to believe for what it says in the word. But for, for example, maybe you often feel isolated or lonely or empty instead of feeling like you're filled with God's presence. Or maybe you feel depressed instead of fully alive. Or maybe you feel weak instead of powerful. So what if, especially as we go into this series on God's love, no greater love, what if you began to change your focus to focus on and try to get on the Holy Spirit's frequency of fullness, life, and power. That's what he has for you. That's what he has for me. What would happen if we begin to say, God, that's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm seeking after is you, your presence, your fullness, your love experienced in my life. What would happen if you did that? Well, maybe you would get creative and you go to BibleGateway.com, to, uh, Bible can't say that web address, and it's a, just a, a place where you can search the, the verses of the Bible. So if you go to BibleGateway.com and you just type in love and you just say, give me all the Bible verses that talk about love, it'll be a little less than 800 verses. If you, if you look up, if you just refine it a little bit and say unfailing love, just search for unfailing love, you'll begin to see, oh, wow, that's God's love. And you'll see all through the Old Testament how God's unfailing love uh, was pursuing you. And so for all, all of history, God has loved you. God has been pursuing you. He, he came. He made himself small. He took on flesh and bones as Jesus came. He, he paid for our sin. God is doing everything he can to communicate his love for you. You might switch your listening habits if you are going to focus on God's love. If you go to Spotify, for example, that's the listening app I use, or, may, or go to um, uh, iTunes or whatever, whatever, wherever you listen to music. But if you go there, like if you go to Spotify and just do a search for playlists, not just song titles, but playlists, for God's love, you're going to see brrr, a whole bunch of worship songs that talk about God's love for you. What would happen if we just began to focus on the fact that God loves us? What would change in your life? I think that's a good experiment. Let's try that.
Let's try that together. Maybe go to YouTube and instead of looking at funny cat videos, just do a search for God's love. You will hear sermons about God's love, podcasts, worship songs, worship events where God's love. There's there's so much to God's love and we're all trying to understand it and experience it. So let's do that. Would you just join with me in this experiment for a few weeks and let's just focus in, dial in to God's love for you. God loves you. Some of you can hardly believe that because you think God's love is based on your worth or your worthiness. That's not how it works. And I'm so glad. That's why God's love is better than any human love. Praise God. So if I could just leave you with this this summary. God invites you to be filled up with the life and power of God through Jesus' love. God invites you right now. God is inviting you to be filled up with the life and power of God through Jesus' love. Praise God. I say yes to that invitation. Yes, I would like to be filled up with, with God's love and with his life and power that come with it. So jump on in. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet and let's pray. Online, pray with us too. Let's, let's just all lean in, in prayer. Prayer is conversation with God. It is talking and listening to God. Let's do both. Let's do both right now. So God, we just thank you for your love. We know you love us. We know, in fact, you are love. It's not just something you do sometimes. It is literally who you are. God, you are love. We just think about that. We want to understand your love. We want to experience your love. Thank you that you did, excuse me, so much to demonstrate your love for us. Thank you, Lord. You overcame our two problems. You became small. You came, you came down to our level, and you dealt with our sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that as we move along in this series, Lord, I pray that we would change on the inside. Lord, I pray that those who are depressed won't be depressed anymore. Those who feel empty won't be empty anymore. That They will be filled with your Holy Spirit and your love and your life and your power. So, Lord, I pray that you would, I'm going to pray a bold prayer here. I pray that you would rock our worlds with your love. Lord, I pray that we'd be so impacted by your love that we would be changed and that we would just have to share your love with someone around us because your love is so amazing and so awesome. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul wrote our key verse, Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 as a blessing, as a prayer. It's, it's a prayer of blessing. There are different ways to pray. pray. You, can pray you can declare God's word. That can be a prayer of declaration. You can ask for things. That, that, that can be a, a prayer where, where you're asking for things, but there's also a prayer of blessing. And so I'd like to just pray this blessing over you today and just speak it over your lives. May you have the power to understand how vast God's love is for you, though it's too great to understand fully. May you personally experience the love of God in Jesus Christ. May you be made complete, filled up with the life and power and the fullness that comes from God. Do you receive that today? Would you just say, I receive that, Lord. I receive it. Yes. Yes, Lord. And would you bow your heads with me for one more prayer? And I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. I don't know if you ever have done that or if you at some point kind of wandered away from God, but I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus today, to become his apprentice. That is the best word picture I can think of. 
where you spend time with Jesus, where you in, invest in learning what he says or what he wants, or where you follow him, where you even imitate him in your life by loving others. I want to invite you to do that. How do you do that? Turn away from your sins. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. Would you like to do that today in the room or online? I want to invite you. If you're not sure you're a Christian, then this is for you this invitation. If you would like to do that today, to put your faith in Jesus to save you, would you just raise your hand just as a signal to me, Pastor, I'm doing that right now. And online, I can't see you, but God can. So I encourage you to raise your hand as well. And people are doing that right now in the room, and it's so great. That tells me God's Holy Spirit is right here. He sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. He loves you. He's doing everything he can so you know he loves you. So what I love to do is just coach you in a prayer online or the people who are raising your hand in the room. Would you just pray this prayer to God? And we're just going to join with them, church, aren't we? Because we just love to see people come to Jesus. So would you pray this prayer out loud to Jesus right now? Here we go. Jesus, Jesus I, invite I invite you into my life. Into my life. I, acknowledge I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Please, forgive Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we applaud those people who are putting your faith in Jesus today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can see it on your faces, and that is so awesome. So here, here's the deal. That's just step one of following Jesus. It's the biggest step but that's step one, and we, we've prepared a course for you to help you know how to follow Jesus, and I just want to encourage you to take that course, and Pastor Christian's going to tell us a little bit more about it. Wow, thanks, Pastor Garen. Yeah. Jesus' love is deep enough to reach you. So, so good. Well, you know, just like Pastor Garen was saying, um, we have the Following Jesus course. It's a free course. Um, we, you can take it online. We also give you a free book. This is for you because we want to help support you as you follow Jesus. We want to walk alongside you in that. To get that, just stop by in the lobby. There's that black black banner and the black table. I'll be there. I'll get you your book. We'll get you, we'll get you all set up to go. And then also, if you filled out a Connect card, would you please just drop it in that little box on your way out, and we will pick it up. And also, because we are starting our groups up tonight, yeah, so excited for that. We're going to need to do a little bit of setup, just set up some chairs in here and back there. So if you could, please stay after service, and we'll get that set up in like three minutes. All right. God bless. See you next week.